take off. Welcome to the Tobacco Online Policy Seminar, TOPS. Thank you all for joining us today. I'm Catherine McLean, a tobacco control researcher at Temple University. TOPS is being organized by myself, Mike Pesco from Georgia State University, C. Shang from The Ohio State University, and Justin White from University of California, San Francisco. The goal of TOPS is to provide a free, multidisciplinary international forum for research using experimental or quasi-experimental variation to study nicotine tobacco policies. This forum is designed to bring together key stakeholders with the goal of breaking silos in tobacco policy research and providing a platform for discussing and disseminating high quality research. The seminar will be one hour with questions asked by the moderator and discussants. The audience may pose questions and comments in the Q&A panel, and the moderator will draw from these questions and com comments in conversation with the presenter. Please review the guidelines on tobaccopolicy.org for acceptable comments. Please keep the comments professional and related to the research being discussed. Comments meeting seminar series guidelines will be shared with the presenter afterwards, even if they are not read aloud. Your comments are very much appreciated. The presentation is being video recorded and will be made available on the TOPS website, tobaccopolicy.org. I will turn the presentation over to today's moderator, C. Shang of The Ohio State University to introduce our speaker. Thank you, Catherine. Um, Dr. Jody Sindler will be leading a grand rounds entitled Regulation of Flavors in E-Cigarettes, DCE Methods, Results, and Policy Implications. Dr. Sindler is a professor of public health, health economist, and public policy expert in the Department of Health Policy and Management at the Yale School of Public Health as well as with the Yale's Department of Economics. Her expertise is on the economics of substance use, including addictive substances of tobacco, all vaping, alcohol, and illicit drugs. She has published on the impacts of substance use on productivity, educational attainment, gender differences, and other policy issues, and in various journals of economics, policy, addiction, health, and medicine. Our discussants today are Dr. Mac Pisco of Georgia State University and John Bridges of the Ohio State University. Dr. Sindler, thank you for presenting for us today. I'll hand the control over to you. Okay, good. Uh, you can hear me now? Yes. Yes? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So I'm very happy uh, to be here to talk to all of you and uh, to discuss the work that I and my co-authors have done over some time period. Uh, the co-authors are listed sort of in order of most recent papers that I've worked with. Uh, you can see John Buckle, Abby Friedman, Kirsten Strombotny, Joaquin Marti, and uh, Catherine McLean. And I want to thank also the organizers of TOPS. This series, I think, is a great idea, and I listened last time. It's been conducted very well. So thank you uh, for the opportunity. I'm just going to report on... I'll just make sure that's right. Report on an, a series of our publications. I don't expect you to read them all, or, uh, but just to show we've been working on this line of research for a while, and I'm going to talk about a few of the papers. The disclosures, I'm um, to indicate that we have funding from NIH, uh, the Yale T Corps, NIDA, the FDA Center for Tobacco Products, and no funding from tobacco or related companies. And I listed an acknowledgement that we list for most of our papers. Uh, although the funding sources may vary. The purpose and the presentation of the plan today are uh, to be grand round styles. And what I mean by that is use the ac accumulated knowledge across um, my and our studies for policy discussion. Uh, we're gonna focus on one study in particular to explain the methods as well as the findings. And then a couple of other studies of both uh, past and uh, current ongoing research. I'm also going to talk about background on key policy issues in the regulation of flavors. And here, I'm not sure whether people, whether this will be repetitive to people or new, but I'm going to spend a little bit of time discussing that. And then I'll do the overview of one study mainly and another, both of which are discrete choice experiments that examine the impact of regulation of flavors on vaping and smoking. Then I'll consider uh, the impact of state flavor bans and tobacco 20 one policies at the state level, which is a new 
like our next study, our ongoing study with the new set of co-authors. And then I'm just going to talk a little bit about evidence-based, the evidence needed for policy purpose and sort of the meaning of the results. Actually, uh, it'll be short, but I just want to keep that in perspective. Okay. So the background and the policy issues, which the policy question is how best to regulate flavors in e-cigarettes. More generally, we're interested in how best to regulate e-cigarettes, but the focus of today is on flavors. And one of the key issues is how best to provide evidence in advance of policy selection. So it's one thing to evaluate a policy that's been implemented, but this is in advance of policy selection to give policymakers uh, uh, evidence about which policy would be best. And the policy level, levels, levers that I'm thinking about are mainly, but not exclusively, flavors in cigarettes and e-cigarettes, nicotine levels, taxes, price, healthiness of e-cigarettes, and could be of cigarettes as well, and tobacco 21 laws, which prevent the sales of tobacco products to people under 21. So the specific question that I'm addressing today is how to regulate flavors in e-cigarettes to prevent use from vaping while allowing uh, e-cigarettes to help smokers to quit, which would be consistent with the FDA's goal of maximizing the public health impact of regulations. A few points uh, are that e-cigarettes and particularly Juul are of key concern due to the rapid growth among youth and the long, that it undermines a long-term decline in the U.S. in smoking rates over time. And we want to- Brody, do you mean, Brody, if I can jump in, so yes. do you mean by that um, undermining the long-run decline in smoking rates that, um, are you arguing that but perhaps Juul could be increasing smoking or is it increasing nicotine exposure? I'm among? saying that, I'll show you a graph on this. What I specifically mean is that uh, we've been very happy that the smoking rates have declined, but then when the vaping rates went up, we were worried about the sharp increase in the smoking rates. So yes, the overall consumption of nicotine has probably gone up. So they're switching products, which is a concern because we thought we made sort of progress on uh, smoking rates going down. Okay. And I will have a graph in a second. And we want to examine flavor bans in the context of other regulations and control from, for them. Also, they are of interest, but right now I'm talking about them more as uh, controls. So we also aim to provide needed information as prior to decision-making by the FDA. And we have current research that will examine state flavor bans to predict the impact of FDA policies. And I'm listing our team. But not only will this research be able to predict the impact of FDA policies, perhaps, but it's also useful on its own right. And uh, I'll talk about that more at the end, the, the interplay between state and federal regulations. Uh, so the background on flavored jewels and e-cigarettes. E-cigarettes came to the market 2006, I'd say. Uh, jewels first sold in 2015 and had 75% market share at peak. Jewels claim to help smokers quit, but they market to youth. And now there are some court cases at the state claiming that uh, they Jewel caused harm by trying to market to the youth. And they have some pretty compelling stories about that. And jewels uh, attract young people, generally people who hadn't been smoking. Uh, they're sleek, appealing, they come in teen appealing flavors. Uh, you can hide them from your parents. Uh, and an interesting thing about jewel is they voluntarily restricted sales of some flavored po pods prior restricted sales of some flavored pods to online only. So mango, fruit melody, creme brulee, and cucumber are available only online, but available in stores are tobacco, menthol, and mint. Presumably they did this because they were concerned about potential regulations that would be harsher than that would, they would do. And all of these are available online. Jody, so I, just, I just checked. Jody, I, I went to the... Yeah. Not uh, true. Jewel website recently, and um, I think that they're only selling uh, Virginia tobacco right now and menthol right now. So I think that they've further restricted their flavors more more recently. Okay, well that's the... good. I did not update that. Uh -huh. They did have two types of tobacco, I think, but now they're. I, I don't I just, even uh, Virginia tobacco. Yeah, but I mean, I think okay, good. 
So that's good. I'm glad you uh, let me know about that. Sure. Uh, and this was answer to your question, Mike, sort of e-cigarettes. This is what we all know, but e-cigarettes have been growing. Uh, this is for high school students. So although different kinds of tobacco products had declined before the entrance of e-cigarettes, after e-cigarettes, uh, the growth has been uh, strong. And that's what people are reacting to with the idea of trying to protect youth from nicotine. So why uh, focus on flavors as a way to regulate vaping? And flavors in e-cigarettes attract youth. They may, uh, flavors themselves may allow people to misperceive the harms of e-cigarettes, suggesting that they're healthier than cigarettes. And fruit flavors, for example, are thought of as healthier. And there's no or very little actual difference across the flavors or just chemicals, but the impression of the names fruit, mint, uh, can allow people to misperceive the healthiness. Menthol is uh, less harsh, mint, ditto, and they appeal to youth because they reduce the uh, harshness. They can be regulated by the FDA, states and localities. And the FDA regulation is a little complicated. It has pre-market enforcement power. And when I come to the states, I'm talking about flavor bans. I will misuse the word for the FDA sometimes saying flavor bans, but what they really have is pre-market enforcement of products that uh, do not protect public health. And that's a whole nother topic that's been ongoing for a while. And flavors could affect smoking rates, smoking quitting rates, because uh, if you're attracted to flavored e-cigarettes, you might substitute or flavors are also available in combustible cigarettes, that is menthol. So that may also affect a smoking rate. So flavors are a policy lever that could be used to affect vaping. And this is just to tell you that flavors are common and fruit is one of the most common flavors uh, followed by mint often, and then a candy dessert and other sweets. So this is just giving a visual of the importance of flavors. So a little bit of background again on the regulation of federal and states. Uh, and since we've had a series of articles, these federal and state laws have been changing in the background as we've uh, done some of our research. We try to update each time. In, as you all know, I'm sure the Congressional Tobacco Control Act in 2006 gave regulatory power over tobacco products, some tobacco products to the FDA. The FDA deemed, which is just the term that's used, control of e-cigarettes in uh, 2016. And then again, the FDA has this pre-market control over flavored products. Um, and it's not exactly, there's been some delays and starts, and so I'm not sure exactly what actions are taking. The enforcing was going to start, in, I think, September 13th. What it'll look like and well, when will be the impact is not completely clear to me. Um, but we will see. Uh, so the FDA can factor flavors into the assess assessment of the impact of e-cigarettes on public health and they can control them. States and localities have been passing uh, regulations on flavors. They started about after Thanksgiving 2019, primarily flavor restrictions on e-cigarettes, but also menthol in cigarettes in Massachusetts, and soon later I put more caveats in, maybe in California. The history of uh, state regulations is that they, states pass a regulation, it might be temporary, it might not be meant to be temporary, but then it's contested in court cases and sometimes they have to withdraw it. And a new thing's happening in California, which is uh, people against the flavor bans are trying to stop it by doing a referendum so that the states have to vote on it, but due to the referendum, the earliest the flavors might be enacted will be 2022 if the refer referendum, referendum is um, considered required. So there's different ways that these that forces have stopped the implementation of these flavor bans. So figuring out which state actually has a flavor ban now, when it came, when it went, is a little bit uh, complicated. And localities have started passing bans around the same time as well. 
So the aims of this work, Jody, oh, the, Jody before you uh, move up, yes, I, uh -huh. I received two uh, several Q and A questions. Uh, one is about a recent e-cigarette uh, use e-cigarette use trend. So the MMRWR report um, reported a decline in use e-cigarette use, and also NYTS 2020 has just been released. Can you discuss about the recent decline in use e-cigarette use and how this may um, influence the, I guess the um, uh, your um, topics here about uh, flavor regulation? Well. Um, As I said, some of these things, well, first of all, some of the research that we were doing that I'm talking about now was before, was published in 2019 and mm -hmm. earlier. Mm -hmm. So those things were not happening in the research that I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. in, the, in the next research that I'm looking at, we will be incorporating that. So a decline in e-cigarette use now is, uh, you know, important, promising, I don't know whether it's due, to, I don't have the information. One of the things that I'm thinking about is uh, how COVID is affecting uh, smoking and vaping in general, because we're worried about respiratory problems and all that. So I don't have a definitive or even tremendously insightful answer, but I can say that what I'm talking about, the projects I'm talking about now were when the e-cigarette use was growing. And I, I still think there's big concern about youths because it's higher than it was before. Okay. So in the next presentation, I can update uh, the data, but this is sort of what we were thinking at the time we were writing these uh, papers. Uh, is there anything else? Yes, and also um, there are some questions uh, regarding the um, use flavor choices. Um, when changed one flavor removed in 2018, shifted from fruit to mint. Uh, so can you comment on the flavor choices change um, over time? From uh, fruit to, I'm sorry, I didn't fruit understand. To, from fruit to, to mint. So, to mint, oh. Yeah. Yes, that the mint is becoming more popular. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, well, that's one thing that I think I'll talk about it a little bit more, how you regulate mint versus menthol, because uh, teens seem to like mint, but not menthol very much. And as far as regulating, I think it's interesting because both mint and menthol apparently have the same amount of menthol in them. So the question is if you regulate, if, you, if one policy was to reduce availability of mint, well, but leave menthol in some products, whether it would really be impactful because the mint level, menthol level and mint and menthol level and mint and menthol are about the same. So I don't know whether, for example, just a little bit of marketing could change people's preference from what's called mint to what's called menthol because they both have a whole lot of menthol in them. But I don't have any definitive um, ideas about how these things will be trade off. The whole, I think one of the important things is how you trade off across different flavors. And flavors can change both in important ways, the underlying flavor, but also in the marketing and how they appeal. Okay, is that? Yep. So I'm going to go back to the aims of this work. And what we wanted to do was analyze the impacts of alternative future regulations to provide findings in advance of selection of policies. New alternative regulations, uh, such as bans on flavors on e-cigarettes and cigarettes, cannot be studied, as I said, using real world data in response to federal policies if they've not been implemented. Um, what we wanted was population an estimate of the population impact, but also by key groups, because there are some groups we're very concerned about, youth, African-American smokers, perhaps those people who have quit and want to remain uh, tobacco-free. Or uh, So we want an overall population best impact, but we want to have the impacts by particular subgroups. So we're interested in the heterogeneity of impact. And we need timely data as the tobacco landscape changes uh, very rapidly. And an important thing from an economist perspective and also a policy perspective is we need to understand the trade-offs, the unintended impacts, particularly focused on substitutes to unregulated uh, products. And why use a discrete choice experiment? It's utility-based, so it's consistent with uh, economist view of the world. Again, we can provide findings in advance of policy selection because we can look at alternative hypothetical products 
and interventions. Uh, we can collect our own purposeful data, so it's aimed at ex exactly what we want to answer. There are rigorous, well-documented methods of which John Bridges is one of the authors on these. Uh, timely findings designed to examine specific policy, as I said, focusing on trade-offs. And you can use the estimates pr to predict or simulate impact under alternative policies. So you can consider which policy would have the more desired impact. Um, okay. And there are many examples of discrete choice experiment in tobacco, and here's uh, some of them. And there may be others that I didn't document as well. So in our first discrete choice study, it wasn't our first study, but the first one I'm talking about, we look at how different flavor bands impact public health. And we ask what would be the set, best set of flavor bands on e-cigarettes and cigarettes. Questions are, should we ban menthol? Uh, all flavors or maintain the status quo? Should we ban similarly or optimally across different cigarette types? And what I'm thinking here is cigarettes, combustible cigarettes and e-cigarettes. And again, we wanna look at the heterogene heterogeneous impact by demographics and smoker vapors. And then we have to ask, what are the goals to reduce smoking, minimize use, of e-cigarettes and cigarettes together by you. So the nice thing about the DCE is you can uh, say, if your goal is this, this would be the best approach. And what we add to previous literature, one thing is we predict the impacts of alternative flavor bans across cigarettes and e-cigarettes using our DCE results. And we can examine both cigarettes and e-cigarettes to get that substitutability. We uh, have a sample of 2, 000, over 2,000 current smokers and recent quitters. The reason we add recent quitters is they might vape, depending on the flavors, they might relapse to smoking or, as I said, switch to vaping. The uh, sample size is larger relative to some other DCEs. And uh, our sample criteria is that they had to have smoked at least 100 cigarettes in a lifetime, which would accommodate both current smokers and recent quitters. We had ages of 18 to 64. And one thing that we do, which I think is important, is we develop quotas so that the, uh, our data, our nationally representative sample of our sample selection criteria, which is current and recent smokers of 18 to 64. And it's an online sample using uh, Qualtrics platform. And they, Qualtrics also, we give them our quotas and they uh, obtain the sample form for us. So in general, uh, I'm gonna go over some of these DCE steps and methods, but I'm giving these to you now so that when I explain what we're doing, you'll uh, maybe follow it a little better. What we do is select attributes and determine levels. Attributes are things we wanna study, like the flavors of the cigarettes and nicotine levels. And um, attributes are flavors, and nicotine, for example, and price, and the levels might be the variation in price, which flavors are banned, and a step is to confirm the importance of each being policy relevant, that you're selecting the right attributes and uh, levels. You have to determine which products you want to select. Do you want to look at e-cigarettes and cigarettes to get the uh, trade-offs among them? Then once we uh, develop the DC, you want to just consider whether it's too long, too difficult, too demanding, or could be understood. And then we uh, develop a survey to accompany the DCE. And um, we randomize to groups to reduce the response, randomize groups to different choice sets, which I'll explain a little bit better, to reduce the response burden. And we make efforts to increase the quality of the data, uh, to explain things well, to visualize products, give practice questions, et cetera. And then we pilot again, to see if they're understanding and also pilot to use the data to design subsets of choice, choice sets that we'll give to each participant. And then we obviously field the study and analyze the data. So that's sort of an overall description. Now I'm gonna tell you what we did in this particular study. We used as products, both combustible cigarettes and e-cigarettes and none of these, which in DCE terms is often called an opt out that you might call it we don't, it's not exactly quitting, but choosing not to have either of these two products. In terms of attributes and levels, we uh, used as an attribute flavors, and we had 
the so-called levels or flavor options that could be banned, tobacco, menthol, sweet, and fruit. And for nicotine levels, we'd have high, low, and medium. We didn't use quantitative uh, numbers because in other studies and other ways, we have found that uh, we didn't think that respondents could relate to the nicotine level put in a more quantitative way. And we used health uh, by die, how many years you would die earlier due to smoking and also price as um, an attribute. So here's the list of our products again, our attributes and our levels. And on the right hand side, you can see the level uh, varies by e-cigarette and combustible, for example. In the flavors, at the time we did this, the combustible, well still combustibles are available in menthol and tobacco and e-cigarettes were available in tobacco, menthol, free fruit and sweet, which are just broad categories. Many, many flavors are available. And we put uh, life years lost and assumed that the life years lost of combustibles was somewhat known to be high, but unclear on the e-cigarettes. And similarly for nicotine, E-cigarettes come in none while combustibles do not. And we gave an alternative set of prices and we described the price very carefully because the price of an e-cigarette and a combustible are not uh, similar. So we used a best best DCE, which allowed two choices uh, per scenario and two opt-outs. And the reason we had two opt-outs is that uh, people could make choices of none in either case. We also did 12 scenarios randomized to three groups. So three groups had 12 sets randomized, gave us a total of observations of the, because the data set is based of your choices. So we had two choices for each of the 2000 respondents and they had uh, 12 choices randomized to them. And choices are the data to analyze. We piloted it, as I said, I'm gonna go over this a little quickly so we could see if people are answering right and we piloted to optimize the number of choice sets. So we did 36 choice sets, which was optimal randomized across three groups. So each group got uh, 12 sets. Okay. Why did we add survey data to this? We did DCE, but we needed uh, data to control um, for socioeconomic and demographic variables. And we also used these uh, to form latent heterogeneous groups, which is policy relevant. We did strategies, as I said, to promote data, including excluding respondents who rushed through the survey because we had data from the pilot, how quickly the average was, how quickly individuals went through it. We employed attention checks. We used a progress bar, which we think helped prevent dropouts. Uh, so we did other efforts to try and increase the quality of the data. And we used exploded multinomial logic choice models, which handles two choices. We combined fruit and flavors in one policy, in one variable, because at the time we were told that was from people in FDA that that seemed like a good way to handle it. And we use what are called flavored cigarette uh, type constant terms, which gives us a more direct preference measure. And again, we used uh, control variables. So we had a utility function that included our uh, constant terms that were uh, flavor cigarette types. And then uh, our estimates, our results here, a cigarette choice model in the best, best um, discrete choice experiment gave us results in our initial regression that uh, the coefficients on constant terms are measures of the preferences. And as you can, and the omitted variable is tobacco cigarettes. So all of the constant terms on the uh, flavored e-cigarettes and also on none are negative, meaning that our sample, which uh, preferred tobacco cigarettes, which is not surprising because we had a sample of smokers. And of course they don't like price, uh, they want a medium level of nicotine and they prefer a healthier uh, product. So we then interacted the flavor product constants with socioeconomic variables to uh, examine heterogeneity. And we use these to predict impacts by uh, groups. So we find that preferences vary substantially across say younger and older adults, African American, Americans and others. And we find that older adults do not like flavors and youngers do, which actually led us to our next paper where we focus on younger uh, individuals. And in terms of light, I would say um, validity checks, we wanted to make sure that 
these were consistent with other findings. In fact, they were. So then we wanted to sim simulate, uh, use our preferences to simulate and predict the percentage of the population that selects each product type or none. And these choice probabilities have to sum to one in each scenario. And they are, these choice probabilities are choice shares that are used to make predictions under our alternative regulatory bands. And we compare what we call the status quo, which we designed to be current regulations to alternative regulations. And the idea was to say, let's look at the current US policy where menthol in combustibles is allowed, but fruit and sugar sweet are banned. And in e-cigarettes, menthol and fruit are both allowed. And then on, under alternatives one through five, we get alternative uh, bands that could be possible. And then we ask what would be the predicted effects of these? What we find is that, uh, th this is a summary of a, the paper that has a lot more uh, predictions as I just showed you above, but the key findings were that if you banned, let me make sure I get this right. Uh, if you banned e-cigarette flavors, then in that first green uh, square, the number of, uh, the percentage of smokers of our sample who chose combustible cigarettes would be 8.3% uh, more than the status quo. So by banning flavors in e-cigarettes, basically you're driving some of these people back to combustible cigarettes, but you are reducing e-cigarettes and you're increasing none a little bit because you're taking away an option. So this is all based on the substitutability across products. If you banned a menthol and combustibles, you would get a reduction in smoking, but an increase in e-cigarettes as you would drive some people to smoking. So if you, well, I'll give you the last one. Then the ban on all tobacco, all, all non-tobacco flavors in all products would drive more people to none because you're taking away product options that they prefer. So the question is, what would be the goal to drive most people as you could to choosing no product, which would be good, but then you're getting um, more people coming into or using cigarettes, fewer using e-cigarettes. Or your goal could be uh, to reduce combustible cigarettes the most by banning menthol, menthol and combustibles, uh, but then you're getting more e-cigarette smokers. So this sort of displays the trade-offs across bands. And when you take away a preferred product, you're gonna drive uh, smokers to another flavored product if they prefer flavors. So the summary of our findings is that we predict that banning flavors in e-cigarettes encourages smoking, banning menthol and combustible minimizes smoking, and banning all flavors in both types minimizes use of neither, but smoking increases, and that's a concern, it's the most harmful way of obtaining nicotine. We also find in our analysis, not just predictions, that smokers and recent quitters prefer cigarettes and menthol cigarettes over e-cigarettes with flavors. Older adults, when we did the heterogeneous breakout by um, age, older adults prefer tobacco only and younger adults prefer flavors in e-cigarettes, including tobacco in uh, cigarettes. So we have strengths and limitations, of course. Uh, we think that we have a large national sample. We specifically designed this to address our questions. Uh, we did steps to promote the quality and we identified heterogeneity. But limitations are, of course, that stated preferences is all that we have prior to the study, but stated and revealed preferences may not be the same. And um, John Bockel and Stefan Hess have an article on this. It's a fast changing market, as I mentioned before. Things have changed, like the Tobacco 21 is in force nationally now and uh, by states. We also look at only product choice. We're looking at market shares of choices. We couldn't, we didn't directly look at um, quantity use, but we asked about that in, uh, you can ask about that in the survey. What might um, be your response? And of course, we can't include all relevant attributes, levels, or products. There's a concern you could, if you ban flavors in cigarettes and e-cigarettes, tobacco companies might in, encourage them or provide them in other, product, other tobacco products. So based on our findings that, uh, well, of the importance of youth and also our findings that youth prefer flavors and adults don't, 
uh, we conducted another discrete choice experiment which focused on youth, uh, which is a greater policy concern. Uh, similarly, we had a sample of about 2,000 aged 18 to 22. We used quotas again. Again, we used a discrete choice experiment with a survey. And attributes included flavors, trouble breathing, which we measured as a short-term health measure. We thought that youth are more focused on the short-term health problem. They're not as concerned whether they get one year taken off their life at the end. And also may be concerned about secondhand harm from smoke or vape uh, and price. So our products here were focused on two types of e-cigarettes and versus cigarettes. And we gave people choice data from eight scenarios. And we used uh, a, a max, multinomial logit and a latent class multinomial logit to analyze our data, which again, the data are choices from the DCE. And I'm going over this very briefly just to give you some of our findings. And our findings were that overall, uh, the sample preferred healthier products and preferred fruit and candy flavors. In our latent class, we found two groups with different preferences. There was a group that we called preferred vaping group. And the reason I say we called is that it, it was characterized, this group was characterized by many different factors, but they did tend to prefer vaping. So we call them the preferred vaping group. They liked fruit and candy the most. They preferred healthier products, but even when the price was high. And the reason we investigated this, we had some problem with the non-monotonicity of uh, price at first, but we think it was all due to the fact that um, the preferred grape vaping group was really willing to pay more to get healthier products, and they preferred uh, reusable e-cigarettes. The preferred smoking group, which was older, older meaning up to 22, white, not Hispanic, lower SES, and less likely to be a student. To, uh, for policy implications, to get the preferred smoking group to quit or not start, the effective policies would be to increase cigarette prices and reduce the harms of e-cigarettes. And we contend that the FDA could regulate e-cigarette uh, harm, not directly, but through some of their, um, their powers of regulation. But reducing the harm, here's the problem, is that reducing the harm of e-cigarettes, which uh, would get the that one group to smoke less, would encourage the preferred rate preferred vaping group to vape more likely. So it's sort of a conundrum. It's a good thing to reduce the harms of e-cigarettes, but it just it um, has a double-edged sword. And so a conundrum for the policymakers. Uh, then that was very brief, but uh, not brief enough, maybe I have little time left. Um, our discrete choice experiments. And, and I just want to mention that we have complemented them with some quasi-experimental design studies. One I'm going to just mention very briefly here and a new area which I want to, if there's time, I will tell you about. And this one, we wanted to know what was the impact of Tobacco 21 laws among adult youth smokers uh, using quasi-experimental evidence. So we took advantage of the fact that exogenous to youth, there was the fact passage of the Tobacco 21 laws at, in some states and not other states, which made it illegal to sell products to youth. So we compared the impact of Tobacco 21 on those above and below age 21 in states with and without Tobacco 21 laws. So we conducted a survey of adult youth on their smoking and vaping. And a key finding was that Tobacco 21 did appear to reduce smoking among the 18 to 20 year olds relative to those 21 to 22 by a considerable amount for the, our sample, which was those who had ever tried cigarettes. We didn't think, we selected those who had ever tried cigarettes because those are the ones we thought would be most affected by the Tobacco 21 law. Uh, so also using what we hope will be a quasi-experimental approach, depending on our data, we're undertaking a new uh, policy analysis, examining the impact of state flavor regulations, adjusting for tobacco 21 laws. And we're using um, the differences across state in both the flavors and the tobacco 21. So one of the reasons I think this is interesting is you can learn from the states what would be the impact of these different regulations for uh, flavors conditional on 
Tobacco 21 laws, which are now, of course, nationally uh, enforced, or at least stated uh, to be constraints. And so, and also, when we look at the next step, if looking at what predicting what the FDA flavor bans might be, they have to be looked at conditional on the fact that now we do have tobacco 21 laws. So our approach is going to be to compare vaping and smoking across respondents in states with different sets of policies. Four different groups that we can compare across are flavor bans in both e-cigarettes and menthol in cigarettes and tobacco 21. Uh, there are a number of states, oh, let me make sure. Yes, no, the, there's Massachusetts and Connecticut, and that's California, which may be enforced soon or may not. This is a, a problem for us. We thought that it was going to be enforced soon and might actually be able to analyze it in real time. But now that this referendum is coming up, it could be a delay. So that's the most stringent states. And then there are states that um, have flavor bans, primarily on e-cigarettes or only on e-cigarettes and a tobacco 21. And then there's states that have a tobacco 21, but no flavors. So comparing across groups two and three, we may be able to see the impact of flavor bans alone, and there's states that have neither. And the team of this is, is across Yale, University of Michigan, and other locations, and some key members uh, are listed here, and they're all, uh, we're all trying to figure out now what's the best approach, and we're just starting this, so we hope to get some interesting results. Okay. Uh, so our approach for this is going to uh, do surveys of 2,000 observations, those 18 to 38. We picked 18 to 38 because we think this is an age range where um, the impact is going to be the greatest. And again, we're concerned about this somewhat younger population. And again, we're going to use quotas to get representativeness. And we're going to do quotas across the different four different groups and well, quotas within each group. And then we're going to uh, have measures that ask about pre and post smoking and vaping. We'll do self-reports with memory prompts, which is why I was mentioning that uh, a lot of these flavor regulations in e-cigarettes started around Thanksgiving or didn't start before Thanksgiving 2019, which we thought might be a memory uh, prompt. Uh, limitations, again, at self-reported data. There's recall issues, uh, state differences. There are differences why these states passed the regulation didn't, which we're going to try and control for by state characteristics. A strength is that we can learn about uh, from these differences by states, apply to the FDA policy choice, so we can have some estimates of the impacts, and we can factor in state responses in expected FDA impacts. So I think the impacts of flavor regulations at the federal level will be different now that we have a lot of state regulations and we also have tobacco 21 laws. So that it's important to consider that the marginal impact of new regulations conditional on what we already have. So a reminder, I want to make it clear that now I went very quickly through some of our um, papers and some of our interests. And now I want to talk just a few minutes on some regulate, uh, some overall reflections. And as I said, I think the changing smoking and vaping landscape means that some of our other early results too and policy predictions may not be as important, so we have to update it with the current situation. And there are many different things that are uh, changing. Commercial firms, Juul withdrew flavors from in-store sales. There's new disposable products that have come out when the FDA said they were gonna regulate pod type flavor cigarettes and they've become more popular. There are other new reduced harm products entering the market. And again, I think the concept of um, commercial firms seem very facile and flexible. So if mint is banned in e-cigarettes, maybe they'll just change the marketing of menthol to appeal to youth, since the underlying flavor chemicals have a lot of overlap. And then states are passing laws, which, as I said, are constantly in flux due to the contested in court. They win, they lose, they try again. And so it's even hard to keep track of which states have flavor bans uh, at any point in time. And another change that's coming is the FDA has a September 13th deadline for pre-market enforcement, but the impact um, is 
is not known. And it's not, not clear to me, fortunately on this project, on the last project, we're working with people from the FDA so we'll have greater insight of how this is going to work. And so we can have a better understanding of the situation. Uh, as I mentioned before, but I'll make it quick here, uh, there are complications in assessing the impacts of flavor and other policies, which are when states have passed bans, then the impact of future federal regulations may be lower than expected or different. The commercial responses are going on, though it's hard to adjust to, we don't know what they're going to be. We need to consider breadth of products that are complements or substitutes, uh, which may become appealing uh, to kids if they're available in flavors. There's an uh, importance of heterogeneity in response to policies. We care about the overall impact, but we may have key groups that we're most interested in, like youths uh, or African-Americans and mental. So we want to consider that. And another thing that I'm thinking about is, has COVID uh, changed vaping and smoking tastes and preferences? Partly because uh, COVID is a respiratory problem. So there may be adjustments that people are making as they think about smoking and COVID. And even sort of lockdowns may change how you smoke, where you smoke, things like that. And we don't have much evidence on that, I don't think yet. Uh, so what do we make of the results when we have them? We're really interested, we, and I think all of us, or maybe most of us on the call are interested in evidence-based policy. But then when we have results, it's sometimes hard to translate those into uh, specific policy implications. Because we have to think of unintended side effects that we may not be looking at, for example, substitutability across regulated and unregulated product, products, the changing landscape, impact on different groups. So I'm just reminding people that once we have results, and how do we go um, to policy suggestions? And maybe it's enough to give the evidence to decision makers, or maybe we want to uh, spend some more time suggesting what are good or best policies and why. Okay, um, so I'm leaving time uh, for questions, comments, and ideas, and I thank you for your attention and um, hope it was helpful or interesting to you. Thank you. Thanks, Jody. Um, here, I'll jump in with uh, one uh, discussion, a, a question, comment. Um, uh, so it's, it seems like uh, like the the best case scenario then, if I understand your research correctly, is the menthol uh, cigarette ban, right? That seems to have the least, um, you know, harmful uh, uh, uninted unintended consequences, right? But it seems to me like the, you know, the policymakers and the advocacy organizations are very heavily pushing the e-cigarette flavor bans, right? Um, and so I was just wondering if you have any sense of like why there's a disconnect between you know, what you're, what you seem to be proposing and what's actually being implemented. Well, I don't have fabulous political insights, but I do know, of course, there's been a lot of pressure by commercial firms to keep menthol. So it was, um, it was kept at the beginning because of political pressure. And it's interesting that even states have not passed menthol bans with the exception of Massachusetts and California that's trying to do that. So, and it used to be, I, I think it's interesting politically because my understanding is that African-American communities sometimes at some point said, well, you shouldn't ban what our population likes the most. But I think now they're saying, well, at least some, I've heard some groups saying, well, banning menthol in combustible cigarettes would be good because cigarettes are harming. So I think it has to do with political pressure but I can't, I don't have any evidence on this and I'm not an expert in it. The banning e-cigarette flavors I think is very popular because people are, uh, policymakers are very concerned about youth and the e-cigarette flavors apply to the youth. The menthol combustible cigarettes apply more to adults and the view may be they prefer that, that was their choice we're not going to put that as a priority. These are just speculations, though. Thank you, Jody. So we have uh, many questions uh, from attendees. Um, there are several related questions uh, about risk perceptions. Um, 
And uh, there is one question asking about uh, why you choose certain attribute levels. For example, is there any, any reason to anchor the health effects of e-cigarettes to cigarettes uh, at a level of 10 years left lost as maximum? So this is about your first study. And in the second DCE study, uh, can you comment a bit more on what you mean by healthier product? Products that uh, the participants perceived as healthier or uh, by any defin definitions, what were they? Okay, so why? So when we choose attributes and levels, it's always just <coughs> the best we can do. So if the question on this slide is, why did we put uh, um, 10 as average years lost? We found that, Statistic in some literature may not be the right one, but that was the be we thought the best estimate for combustibles, and so we wanted to match that with e-cigarettes. And the idea was to just provide a range of hypothetical alternatives on e-cigarettes because we didn't have data on how many years lost due to e-cigarettes. Mm -hmm. So they were just trying to do our best and to get some um, variety in e-cigarette levels. Now, the question of a healthier on our second uh, study, we defined it carefully to the respondents. Right now, I can't remember exactly what we said, but in each case, before we did the uh, experimental design, we explained all of our attributes, our levels. Uh, we tried to do it carefully to the respondents, and then we gave them a practice uh, discrete choice option and then even gave them the option of saying this is what you chose is this what you wanted to so we provided uh, what we hoped was clear explanations of the uh, attributes and the levels and also the instructions including visuals to make people understand the difference between say uh, reusable whatever we did, uh, different kinds of uh, e-cigarettes which in the second study, I'm looking for that now. Okay. Uh, so, as I said, we tried to explain the attributes and the levels very carefully so that people would not be confused. And that's when we did the pilot, we also asked them, were there any areas that confused you? What was clear, what wasn't? And then went back and tried to clear up potential um, misunderstandings. We also took, as I said, we took out people who rushed, we deleted people who rushed through in a way that we thought they couldn't really be answering carefully, if they could be straight lining. So we tried to focus, we hope we're focusing on people who understood better, both by explaining it carefully and uh, eliminating those who rushed through. Okay. Uh, so did you take all people that made intransitive uh, choices as well? In your sorry, I didn't, I didn't get to hear the whole thing. Did you remove individuals that made intransitive choices as well like for example um if this if an option was all the same but the price increased in one it wouldn't make sense for them to choose the option with the higher price right if they had previously selected in the opposite option with the lower price we discussed that i i honestly i have to get back to you. i don't think we did that um and in some cases when the in the youths we found that it wasn't entrancing, but it was non-monotonicity in price. So we looked into what was the cause of that. So we did try to understand, and I can't, I know we talked about entrancivity, but I don't think we, we uh, did anything about that. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think we did look, I'm not even sure if we had that. I can't, I honestly, sorry, I can't remember. John Buckle is on the line, but he's on mute, so he can't. Uh, I can pro promote him. To no, I think he. I think he's not a. I mean, he's. I don't think we talked about it in advance. He wouldn't be available to comment, even okay. though he's available to okay. listen. Uh, so, well, there are some other questions related to, to uh, risk of perceptions. So there is a comment about um, a large proportion of the U.S. public mistakenly mm -hmm. believes e-cigarettes are as harmful as cigarettes. So if flavors make young people perceive e-cigarettes as less harmful than cigarettes, then that's likely to make those perceptions more accurate. Um, so I guess related, can you comment on that? And also, are you DCE's power to study the uh, two-way interaction effects? Because say, if you have flavors and you have risk perceptions as attributes, supposedly you can investigate how those two attributes jointly influence the choices. Um, can you comment on that? 
Well, uh, let me make sure, I hope that I can. So risk perceptions, we get, they, we gave the, um, let me put this right here. We, in the, oh, where is this? Here. When we do the choice task, we say, suppose option one, the nicotine level is higher, is high, and you die earlier, 10 years. So we're not asking them to use their, not, we're asking them not to use their own perception, but to say, if this was your hypothetical choice, what would you pick? So if you look on the right-hand side, option one, the risk is dying early. We're saying it's 10 years. And we explain in advance the set of the attribute die earlier and the options. So that the idea is that they say, oh, if it were like in the top left-hand corner, tobacco flavor, nicotine high, and die earlier, if that were your option for the cigarette package, how would you pick this over an e-cigarette with different characteristics? So we're asking them not to bring their own risk perception to the DCE, we're giving them options. Mm -hmm. Uh, can you also comment on the capacities of DCEs? Um, there are two related questions. So one is about um, whether it can account for the complementary due use of cigarettes and e-cigarettes. Um, if you force the respondents to make one choice, where in real reality they can choose to use both. And also, can you also comment on the um, uh, evaluation of various policy options uh, within the experimental tobacco market marketplace paradigm. So it's a different uh, methodology, which allows you to evaluate demand within individual participants for various products as a function of increasing product price and the various policy constraints. So can you okay. also come well, Let me start that? with uh, complementarity. We, we, people get 12 options, 12 scenarios. And in this case, they get to choose two options. So in each option, you could pick a, a, a cigarette or an e-cigarette. So we do have across these scenarios, people that pick both. So in one of our studies, we had latent class of dual users, vapors and smokers. So we are picking up people who want both. I want to use both and maybe for, for different reasons. Or um, so it isn't that they just get one choice. We're allowed, we can see dual users in the data, which I think was the question. Uh, the second question is totally different, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure you're asking about marketplace paradigms. I know some of those studies and some of the paradigm, and it's, a, I mean, are you asking exactly how this compares or are they good or they bad or I'm not? Sure, I'm qualified to um, answer completely. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, from my reading, it's asking about uh, maybe um, why do you have considered evaluating policy options using tobacco marketplace paradigm? Uh, yeah, my understanding is maybe you can comment on uh, the differences um, if possible. Oh, we can move on other related to other related questions. Um, well, I. I we, we think that this is the best way of going and some of the marketplace paradigm studies are, are I'm sure very good and I've seen some with pretty small samples. So a nice thing is that we're able to get with the DCE, it's basically based in economic utility theory and we can get a big sample and we can control the situation. So I think the other studies could be good as well. We chose to do this one. Okay. So can you also comment on um, how well your DCE fundings align with the observations derived from real world policy change? So since you've talked about both using observational data and uh, discrete choice experiments to study the same policy. So is the question, how do we, how do, uh, how do we, experiment mm -hmm. studies and results from DCE compare? Yes, mm -hmm. yes, how well are they uh, matched? terms of uh, yeah, fundings? I, I, it's hard to generalize because there's a whole bunch of DCEs and a whole bunch of quasi-experimental and non-quasi-experimental. I know that sometimes they're matched because we do sort of scan the data from other studies to see whether what we're finding is consistent. We might be, have different 
specific findings, but the general idea of trade-offs, price mattering and things like that are consistent across a variety of different approaches. It's hard to say what's consistent more generally because there are some studies that are better, bigger samples than others. And I, I don't have really a good estimate of how close they are across different things. And often it's not um, asking exactly the same question or controlling for the other factors in the same way. So for example, when we look at the impact of flavors, we're also controlling for other factors like nicotine level, uh, health of pet impacts and socioeconomic and demographic measures where another study might not control for all those things like in a quasi experimental looking at if you only looked at a state with and without a flavor you might not be controlling for those other factors okay but so broadly people are certainly i think finding i maybe putting my put in a hole but uh, flavors do appeal to youth more than adults and flavors seem to drive uh, product choice across different studies, I believe. Uh, can you also comment on the nicotine attribute? Most adults, including many smokers, believe that nicotine is very harmful. So if you present nicotine levels as low, medium, and high, uh, how do you know that you are assessing preference for nicotine levels as experienced versus harm perceptions related to nicotine level? Well, then when we say nicotine level high or low, let me mention we were very interested in this at first because when the FDA came out saying that they could uh, require non-addicting levels of nicotine, we thought that was a really interesting area and we still think it's interesting. But our, inter our inclusion of nicotine came partly from that, that there could be and that e-cigarettes have none. But, uh, and we, we, but we, did, we thought of and asked people about quantitative measures and they didn't understand nicotine levels. If you ask them how much nicotine their cigarettes had, they didn't really understand. So when we say nicotine level high or low, we explained what, that nicotine was the, uh, uh, mainly related to addiction and it wasn't as much of a health consideration as the uh, tar, perhaps. So what people are thinking about nicotine level, they could bring to it, you know, we gave them some uh, points, what, how we wanted to think about it, but they could bring to it themselves other things, like, like other perceptions, but mainly they had a pretty strong preference for medium, which could have also meant that they didn't have strong preferences. They just wanted something that looked like it was in the middle because they didn't know enough about nicotine. I think people confuse nicotine smokers with health impacts. And here we tried to separate them. Um. So here is also one question uh, regarding the uh, differential impacts uh, by groups. So uh, you noted there, there is disparities in the use of flavors, menthol e-cigarettes by race. Um, and Af African-Americans are also much less likely to use NRT. Uh, did you simulate the effects of only a ban on all e-cigarette flavors? And how this may differentially impact these groups? So is the question, how does race affect these choices? Yes, these, and especially in your simulation, did you do the simulation uh, by race groups as well? Well, we, uh, let me just make sure I did this right. We controlled for race, I believe, when we did the simulations, but we didn't focus on what was the impact, what was the specific impact of race on choices. So we looked at, overall impact. I mean, we want to do the predictions and race was a contribute contributory of the prediction, but we didn't, I don't remember the specific race results. I mean, I could look at them, but I don't really remember what the, what race, how the, how race affected these choices. Thank you. Something we could have looked at, but we didn't. Okay, to see if I have this. <laughs> I, 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 that's all I can say right now. I'm sorry. I'm looking for some results. But, um, yeah, it's not, 
we can we can look at, for example, here African American how it affected um, that African Americans preferred menthol combustibles. We can see that they uh, significantly preferred that. They significantly preferred menthol e-cigarettes, and they I'm reading across the line preferred flavored e-cigarettes. But so we have specific coefficients. We didn't pull it out as a separate area of the study. We are out of time. Thank you, Dr. Sindelar, for the presentation and to the moderator and discussants. Finally, thank you to the audience for your participation. 140 people attended the seminar today. David Ashley of Georgia State University will be our next seminar speaker on October 2nd. His presentation title is U.S. FDA Center for Tobacco Products Regulation and Scientific Decision Making. In the meantime, please submit your research on tobaccopolicy.org and please suggest to your colleagues that they sign up for our email list. You will receive a survey on your satisfaction with the seminar today. We really appreciate the feedback. Thanks again for participating and have a top-notch weekend. Thank you. And thank you.